Dr. Shabir, welcome to Let the Quran Speak. My pleasure to be on. So far, we've been looking at different Quranic verses that reference women's covering um, in some way, Dr. Shabir. And now we want to turn to the Hadith, because when we looked at the Quran, we saw that, okay, the verses are not necessarily that clear in terms of what they prescribe for women's clothing. It doesn't match up with the way there's a certain uniform for Muslim women these days. So, Dr. Shabir, when you look at the Hadith, is it clearer um, in terms of what Muslim women should be wearing? No, no, it's not, it's not so very clear. So uh, to support what you have said, it's almost become iconic that the Muslim woman is represented as being so totally covered. And uh, in the classical books, you will find uh, it defined like this. The Muslim woman is to cover all of her body except her face, hands, and feet, according to the Hanafi school. Uh, or even the feet has to be covered according to some other schools. And the Hanbali school being even more strict, requiring even the face and the, and the hands to be covered. A woman is to wear gloves, for example. Uh, so where does this outline come from? We've seen that it's not in the, in the Quranic verses. Uh, certainly it's in the commentary on the Quranic verses, but there is a distinction to be made between the verses themselves, what they say in the literal Arabic, and what the commentators are making it to mean. Uh, now we come to the Hadith, and you might expect that, okay, maybe they got it from the Hadith. Uh, the Hadith must have specified all of this. Um, but if we search for the hadith in, the, in all of the standard books of hadith, you will find that there is no one hadith that really gives you this kind of standard definition. The closest we get to this is in a hadith in Abu Dawood, um, in Abu Dawood's collection, which uh, says that Asma, the sister-in-law of the Prophet, peace be upon him, appeared before him uh, with uh, some thin garments. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, said to her, Asma, when a woman reaches puberty, it is not permissible for her to uh, show except this and this. And uh, in saying so, the Prophet, peace be upon him, pointed to his face and hands. Mm -hmm. So some would use this as a proof that the face and hands are the only things that can, ex can be exposed in public. The rest of the body has to be covered. So this is close to one of the standard definitions. Mm -hmm. However, this hadith reported by Abu Dawood um, uh, is, is noted by Abu Dawood to be a morsel tradition, which means that it does not have a connected chain of narrators going all the way back to the Prophet, peace be upon him. Hmm. And it is widely recognized um, as being weak, especially by those who want to insist on the woman covering the face. Mm -hmm. Because see, this one shows that you, shouldn't, you don't need to cover <laughs> exactly, your face. Yeah. Exactly. It's interesting, uh, though, because that hadith is often brought out when, when we talk about hijab. Uh, yes, yeah. yes. So those who want to support the idea that the woman's face uh, can be uncovered in public will use this hadith as a, as a reference mm -hmm. uh, because it seems to prove that. Uh, now, uh, the, the other camp who want to argue that, uh, th those who want to argue that the face should be covered will uh, say that this hadith is weak and they seem to have a, a good point here because the, in terms of the chain of narrators, uh, there is a problem. Okay. Uh, but they will also add that even if we accept the hadith as being sound, uh, it must have been a reference to something that happened before the time when the hijab uh, came to be mm. instituted in Muslim communities. So they have this idea of, uh, you know, uh, prior to the hijab verse being revealed and after the hijab verse being revealed. And it's almost like black and white and technicolor, right? Uh, so uh, if they get a, a narrative like this, they can easily castigate it as being, you know, um, from the time uh, of the black and white period. Hmm. And now we're in Technicolor, so that does not uh, really apply. And so too, they will relegate uh, some uh, other narratives that show that the women were not so fully dressed. Like, for example, narratives that say that um, some of the wives of the Prophet, peace be upon him, were there in the battlefield. Uh, helping the soldiers, maybe they gathered arrows they, uh, that were fallen, they uh, nursed uh, the wounded and so on, brought water to those who were thirsty. Uh, and as, uh, narrative says, uh, somebody says, I saw Aisha, the wife of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and her shin was bare. Hmm. Uh, so they would say, oh, uh, yeah, but this happened in the black and white phase. That doesn't apply anymore. That's not the going rule. The going rule is what came in the technicolor phase. Uh, but uh, even if um, you, you try to do that with the hadith, you must bear in mind that the, the men who were narrating this, uh, if they were in the, the, the color phase and they realized that this is from the black and white, uh, they, they shouldn't have been uh, narrating this kind of uh, detail uh, because it means that they have the imagery in their minds of the uh, woman in that state of undress. 
and and they're comfortable narrating that. So rather, you know, it didn't make any difference. Like, okay, they were there gathering arrows. Why do you have to describe uh, uh, their attire if, uh, by your present standards, uh, that that would be uh, deemed an mm -hmm. indecent type of attire? It would confuse attire. people too, right? Exactly. So probably yeah. they would provide some context and say this happened before the mm. revelation. That's right. right. So. The way I, I piece together all of this is that, Safiya, I see that there is an evolution in Muslim thought about how uh, the Muslim woman should, should dress. Uh, the, the verses, the Quran came and left the matter vague. Hmm. Hadiths uh, were uh, narrated and eventually collected and the matter was still vague. But eventually, uh, Muslim commentators went back to the verses of the Quran and they try to give things as literal a meaning as possible. So they looked at the Surah 24, uh, verse 31 uh, verse, and uh, they, uh, they, they, they saw that it said, okay, let the woman not reveal of her ornaments except what ordinarily appears. And now they try to say, okay, we start from the position that the woman should cover all of her body except what normally appears. Mm. So taking it in this kind of literal way, they're now trying to say, okay, what normally appears? Okay, well, her face would have to appear because otherwise, you know, how would she go about and how would she be identified and all of that? Her, uh, somebody says, but her hands have, have to appear because if she's buying and selling, you know, the hands have to appear. So, you know, whatever ornaments are on her face, the nose ring, for example, whatever is on her fingers, maybe a ring, all of that would become exposed and that's not indecent because they're starting with the idea that all of the woman must be covered mm -hmm. and then accept what has to mm -hmm. appear. Uh, and, and so this is a later idea. Otherwise, if this was an early idea, if that's what uh, Muslims understood from the Quranic verses from the very inception, you would find that the hadiths would be going into great detail and taking it further because the normal pattern is that the Quran says, jump this high, and the hadiths make it like jump this <laughs> high, okay? Yeah. So, so that's the normal pattern. Mm -hmm. In, in this case, we have it that the Quran is not telling you how high to jump. And, and the hadith also like is all over the place, like is scattered. It's not really telling you uh, how high to Could jump. Could it just be because people already knew how to dress? Like they just had a basic sense of, you know, there, there was an understanding of how they should dress in society in, already? In some, in some cases, we can assume that, you know, something is so obvious that nobody is going to mention it. Like, you know, the Prophet, peace be upon him, had two eyes and a nose. We, mm -hmm. we, we don't need a hadith mm -hmm. to tell us that. We, we just know he's a human being. That's what he had. But in almost every other thing, like the hadiths go into such great detail, they don't take anything for granted. They don't leave any stone unturned. They explain everything in great detail. In terms of clothing, um, if we look at any one of the classical books of hadith, uh, you know, Bukhari, Muslims, uh, uh, Ibn Abu Dawood, Ibn Majah, Tirmidhi, An Nasai, uh, just to name the, the most six the, uh, prominent ones, the six most prominent ones, they will have uh, a chapter on uh, libas or, or, or wearing clothing. Mm -hmm. And that's only one of like multiple chapters dealing with all aspects of human life. And then within this uh, whole chapter of which they will call a book, they will call book of libas, uh, uh, um, kitab al libas. So then within this, you will have so many different hadiths about like the virtues of wearing white, uh, why men cannot wear something that is, uh, that is dyed in, in safflower, uh, why a Muslim man cannot wear something that is uh, red, he cannot wear red, mm -hmm. red garment and so on. Um, a lot of hadiths about uh, the length of the men's garments, like it can't go past the middle of the shin, but then, okay, if you want to make it longer, one a span longer, but don't let it go past the ankle because, you know, that's going to be in hell. Uh, hadiths about wearing garments out of pride. Uh, so hadiths, so many hadiths about various aspects of, of, uh, of garb. And, and a lot more about men's garments. Really? Yeah. When it comes to women's garments, there are only a few hadiths comparably. Mm -hmm. and, and these are very vague. For example, there's a hadith saying that uh, when the verse of hijab was revealed, and, and there too we have to clarify that the hadiths are vague as, as to which, which verse verses, right? of hijab yeah. is meant. Mm -hmm. Because the, word that, the one that mentions the word hijab is Surah 33, verse number 53, which we already explained mm. before. Which, which, is a, which is a kind of divider, not necessarily the, the article of clothing. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And, uh, and uh, some of the hadiths uh, uh, mention the verse of hijab to be Surah 33, verse number 59. That's the one that speaks about jilbab, where the women are told to bring uh, you know, part of their jilbabs over them. 
uh, and some uh, make this a reference to Surah 24, verse number 31, where the, the khimar is mentioned. So it looks like people, you know, the hadith, as I said, are scattered. People are not so very clear about what refers to what. But anyway, um, one of the hadiths about this that is found in uh, uh, Sahih al-Bukhari says that uh, when the verse, uh, uh, clearly now in Bukhari, it's 24, verse number 31, uh, was revealed, the verse that mentions the khimar, uh, the, uh, the women, uh, the wives of the Prophet, peace be upon him in particular, not necessarily all women, uh, tore a, a part of their lower garments, mm -hmm. uh, yes. you know, towards the hem. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's the very lowest part. And uh, they, uh, they, they, they covered themselves. So uh, is from the word khimar. So it means literally they made khimars of these. But uh, uh, they use them as khimars. Okay, but uh, th what does it mean? Does it mean that uh, the verse meant to them that the chest area needed to be covered, and so they used those pieces of cloth to cover the chest area? Maybe they draped, draped it around their necks, or does it mean that they wore it on their heads? When we think of khimar, we normally today think of a head cover. So is that what it meant, that they used that as a head cover and it, it was drawn over their bosoms as well, as the verse uh, seems to indicate? So there's some vagueness, but, but in, in the light of all these, this vagueness, let us not lose sight of the fact that they were able to tear a part of the lower garments, mm -hmm. which means uh, that the, the length of the lower garment is not so very well defined. Mm -hmm. And um, it is even mentioned in another hadith that is in Abu Dawood, uh, that uh, Umm Salma, one of the wives of the Prophet, peace be upon him, mother of the believers, uh, says to the Prophet, peace be upon him, you know, okay, so what about women? When, because the Prophet was talking about the men's garment, it has to be to the middle of the shin. And then if you're not satisfied with that, another, you know, go a little bit longer. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, okay, for women, all right, so one span more. Mm -hmm. um, so w what is the more than what? Like, where, what's the starting point? Is it from the men's garment, middle of the shin, and then one span more? And uh, so Umm Salma says, well, you know, then there will be some exposure. So he said, okay, well, up to a cubit, um, but, but not more than that. So that would be something like 18 inches. Uh, but where's the starting point? Is it the knee? Is it the ankle? If, if it's the ankle, it would mean uh, that the dress... Uh, it's way know, too long. It'll be too yeah. long. It'll be trailing behind. And, you know, they didn't have paved streets at that time. They didn't have fabric. They didn't have, well, you know, it wasn't fabric easily even. accessible. Yes, because sometimes you read stories about, like, you know, um, a, a, a person dies and they don't have enough cloth to cover the, the, the entire uh, uh, body, the corpse. And so they would cover the head with the cloth and, and they would leave the feet, uh, well, rather than leave the feet exposed, they would cover the feet with tree leaves mm. because they didn't have enough garment. So it, we, we shouldn't imagine that life at the time was as it is now. Uh, with all of its luxuries, and we shouldn't think of the women's dress as being so like, luxuriant to be dragging on the floor behind them as they walked, almost like a wedding gown. Um, so if, if we are to analyze this hadith with all of these considerations in mind, you realize that uh, the, the, the length of the woman's garment was not specified even in these hadith, not to talk about the length of the sleeves and, and um, you know, other aspects of the woman's dress um, and so on. So uh, we saw that there is a hadith that would give you that outline, but is declared to be a weak hadith. And this is the normal pattern. Like when you look at hadiths over time, you see, if you, let's say Bukhari, the most authentic among the six collectors. Then you go to Abu Dawood, which is also one of the six authentic bo books, but not like Bukhari. And then you go to Ibn Majah, which has hadiths that people have said, you know, one or two are, you know, totally out. Uh, so. And then you see a kind of evolution. You see that Bukhari is, has very minimal information about the wom Muslim woman's dress. Um, uh, Abu Dawood has even more, like, mm -hmm. you know, section after section dealing with that. And then Ibn Majah has even more. But, but it's not so much more in terms of quantity, even in Ibn, Ibn Majah, but it is the, the, the nature of the narratives. You can see that Ibn Majah has uh, more in terms of specifying the outline of the Muslim woman's dress. It's mm -hmm. trying to make the garment longer mm -hmm. uh, so that it will be trailing behind the woman as she, as she walks. Uh, so the, we, we see there's an evolution in thought over time. And uh, it, it seems that over time, the, 
Muslim community was developing its own consciousness of, uh, of a higher level of modesty, which is a good thing, and where it works for people who is to complain. Uh, but uh, if we're to say that, well, this becomes the standard for all time, and now we have to go back to see, well, what did God actually say in his book? What did the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, actually instruct? Uh, if we are to derive a rule for all time. But it looks like the rule that is now bandied about as the rule for all time is something that is not actually clearly based on the Quranic text, nor is it clearly based on uh, the narratives that are reliably, report, reliably reported from the Prophet, peace be upon him, but more so based on the cultural development within early Muslim societies. All right, we'll leave it at that. Thank you for your time, Dr. You're Shabir. welcome. Support us today and help us share the message of Islam with people across the globe. Thank you, and may God bless you and your loved ones with the very best always. <laughs>